When we are studying relationships among more than one random variable, we may have to compute the expected value of a product of those random variables. Now that could be a pain, but something can simplify. If we know those random variables are independent, we can show that the expected value of the product of those random variables is equal, breaks down, to the mean of each of those random variables. And we can say something more we can say that if we take a fun some function only on x, here it's called g, and some function, say h, which is on and y, then it breaks down to the mean of that function of x times the mean of that function of y. That's a more general result than what I've just said. So this, if g and h are just identity functions, this is the result, and this is a result that you've probably all seen in basic stats courses in relation to covariance. So I'm going to prove this result and then we're going to apply it to this and solve this problem. And third, then I'm going to link this to covariance and correlation. Okay, so we'll be using results uh, that we've used in previous problems. X and Y, let's look at the condition first, are independent. That's the most important thing. Continuous random variables. They need not be continuous, they could be discrete, but for the purpose of the proof here, they've just said continuous, so we'll stick with that. But no, it can apply to discrete as well. And then this result holds, provided the expectation exists. Well, whenever you deal with expectations, they're never guaranteed to exist, so we'll say, supposing that they exist. Right then. So we state what this is. So, so this is by the definition of the expected value of some function of the variables. I've just used this result here. The expected value, I'm saying k function of k, that depends on two variables, x and y, is equal by definition, guys, to and then this result. So the outcome multiplied by the PDF values for the x and y and integrated over this is another way of writing minus infinity, plus infinity, minus infinity here to plus infinity. If you haven't seen this before or you're a bit puzzle of what this is saying, just look back where I've just solved it for concrete cases in problems 14, 24 and 25 and that's for continuous and discrete cases. So we can replace this if x and y were discrete by summations instead. Alright, so let's look at this because this is a repeated or double integral here. Uh, I've done it in blue and green just to show you on which bits they're acting on. So um, you don't have to understand this but I'm just going to say it anyway just to remind you about double integration this you can be read as follows. You can fix the x at some point, some value, and do the integral with respect to y. So do the inner bit first. And then when you've done that, then integrate with respect to x. This density here is called the joint density because it's got more than one variable in it. So it's some function involving both x and y, satisfying the properties of a density function. Okay, so that can be a headache to calculate, but the whole point is with independence, the thing simplifies. Why? Look, it goes from this line to this line. Now, what's happened here? Well, because x and y are independent, this means that the joint is equal to the product of the marginal PDFs. Again, if you don't understand or the distinction between joint and marginal PDFs, look back at those problems where I discuss the difference. You can think of it, guys, in terms of uh, events or property A in section B. You all know this, so just look at it analogous to that. That's what this is doing for the continuous case. Uh, uh, when we look at continuous random variable, sorry. So over here, I've just substituted this for the joint, a uh, marginal for fx and fy. I put the subscript here to show you because I, I can't be using different letters all the time. F subscript x denote the marginal for x, f subscript y for the marginal that's it, uh, PDF for y. So substitute that in for the here, and then you can separate it out because this only depends entirely on x, this is entirely on y. But by definition, guys, this is the expected value of the function g of x, and likewise this is the expected value of h of y, where the question says supposing these integrals exist, uh, these uh, expectations exist. So we're done. One thing to note in terms of notation is that 
notice I start off with capital X and Y because that's the random variables. But when we're integrating, we're integrating all of the possible realizations of X and Y and we denote those by little cap, so little y and little x. So I've got little y and little x going over here and, and then at the end then we go back to big X and big Y. If we were going to do this proof for the discrete case, just replace the integrals by a double summation. So I look at the proof, I'm happy with it because I have used the condition of independence in my proof and that's this line here. If I didn't find a place to use independence then the result can't be correct. So there is, that's the key line that simplifies the calculation of this guy here. Simplifies it because I'm just trying to think of the easy ways to tell you guys this is a bit of a mouthful guys because you've got X and Y's mixed up everywhere here, through here. Whereas when you break it down like this, this is just going to involve a simple calculation just involving X. Well, not necessarily simple, but it just involves X. You can break it into two bits and some uh, integral here and just involving Y's. So it's like a clean separation between the X and Y's which you don't get in the first line here. Uh, yeah, I just spotted one other thing I could say. Going back to the first line here, some of you might be thinking, well, can I put dx and then followed by dy? Well, of course you can, you just reverse these two because the order of integration here does not matter. But when you reverse these two, you're not really reversing these two because they're both from minus infinity to plus infinity, so you can't tell the difference. And, uh, you can only tell the difference here because I've got the colored integral signs here. Okay, that's proof done. That's already like enough for a video, but it's good to just tag onto this an example. So let x and y be exponential distribution of parameter 1. Find the expected value of this transformed of the x, y. Alright, let's recap. If x is an exponential distribution parameter lambda, we may parameterize it like this. So I'm going to write, this is where we're going to write it. For x bigger than 0. And then the expected value of x is 1 over lambda. These are proofs I have done. Okay. Now, this is what we want to calculate. But this is equal to that using this rule, which hopefully you know. And this is equal to this because we've just applied the theorem. This is like my g of x, this is my, like my h of y. Now, since you're told that x and y are both exponential distribution with the same parameter being 1. You could just say I just need to take calculate one of these guys say this x uh, expected value of a function of x and then just square it because it's, it's going to be the same for y if you wanted to do that. So let's just look at this guy here same treatment for y you see. Then here that is my g of x some function of x and using the rule that we've already used above. We get this line, so it's the integral of um, this function of x times the PDF of x. So lambda here is 1, so set lambda here 1, 1, and then that's how you get this guy here. That's the PDF. And again, just combine the these exponentials, add those two together, I get that number there, that's all that's changed at this step. And then this step you can do the integral or I'm not going to do the integral directly. I'm going to note this. I and this is a familiar there I say trick or it's just easy to say method method. Don't want to think I'm doing magic here. This look at this, it looks similar to this, right? Where lambda is a half. Well, I'm missing if I had a half here, if I had the lambda half here, then I know a property of the integral of I mean, the area under the curve, whole of the curve of the PDF must be 1, because that's uh, one of the properties of a PDF. So if I put in a half there, I just multiply by a half, those two cancel, this expression is the same as this expression. But the cool thing is now, this integral must come to 1, because it is the PDF of an exponential with a parameter 1 and that saves me having to integrate because we know how how horrendous integration can be right so this is uh, quite um, this is uh, just one of those standard 
techniques that statisticians use if you haven't seen it before but if you watch my other videos you'll have seen it I've used several times alright so that's equal to 2 the same for the function of y up here but I don't have to repeat it because it's the same thing so it's going to be the same number so it's going to be 2 as well so my answer is 4 finally I want to link up the result that I've just proved with the correlation recall that for a random variable I'm not talking about sample guys the correlation of the two random variables is the covariance divided by the product of the standard deviations so we can see from here that since the bottom the standard deviations aren't going to answer we're assuming it can't be zero the positive I we're going to look at proper random variables the correlation is zero if and only if the top part which is the covariance is zero but by definition for random variable covariance is this minus this and you've just seen that in the proof that if x and y independent this minus this is zero because they're the same number so if the covariance of this guy is zero i this is equal to that the correlation is zero now this is where we're going to be careful here note from the proof we've shown that if x and y independent that implies this the breakdown of the expectation of the cross product but guys it's important to note that the reverse doesn't hold i.e. if you find that this holds it does not mean that x and y are independent if this is equal to that all you can say is that x and y are uncorrelated but you need more to say whether they're independent or not because uh, independence is a much stronger condition than correlation as you know independence implies zero correlation but zero correlation does not imply independence finally a lot of all these things I'm saying today are very important finally although we've done it for two variables you could do it for any number of variables the same method of proof okay so three four whatever right guys how'd you find that was that helpful comment share like Thanks for watching.